How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Two Degrees Podcast, brought to you by the Play On Foundation. Today, I have an amazing guest for you. I had the pleasure of working him on one of the biggest shows to come out on the CW, and that show is The 100, and the actor I'm talking about is Richard Harmon. How you doing, buddy? Happy to be here, my friend. Thank you for having me. (laughs) What's going on? So, you're still in Vancouver. I'm still in Vancouver. I haven't left since the pandemic uh, i hope it's okay it's friday 6 p.m i figured i'd have a little cocktail while we talk i hope no, that's fine fair, fair. <laughs> I'll, I'll toast you this big mug of tea <laughs> there you go um but uh <clears throat> i hear the weather's not, insane the weather is pretty crazy to make it worse it's doing that like it's snow one like heavy snow one day and then the next day it's going to be pouring rain and it'll just make it sloppy oh. and, and very slippery. Then the next day it'll be snow again, then rain and snow. It's not consistent. It's, and it was pretty cold there like last week or two weeks ago, like around Christmas, it was like yeah. negative 15. I don't think or Celsius for wherever this audience is listening from Celsius is what we're talking <laughs> here. Negative 15 Fahrenheit would probably be pretty awful. Um, oh, around man. Christmas, I don't think, I'd ever seen in the 24 years I've lived here, or 26 rather, that it's ever been that cold. Jeez. Now, I guess that's a good place yeah. to start with this is um, I never knew until like just recently doing this podcast too. And like before I start on any um, call, I'll do a little quick wiki just to see if there's anything interesting else that I don't want to bring up. But you're from mississauga saga that's right i don't think i ever lived in mississauga to be fair okay my parents my parents were shooting a a tv show i believe i might mess up this story uh but a tv show back in the yeah 91 was the year um and Hmm. so i just so happened to be born in the mississauga uh hospital I gotcha. don't know if I ever lived gotcha. there. I think I lived. In, I think I lived in Barrie, Barrie, Ontario, for a little bit, a little Midhurst, and then mm-hmm. uh, Ithaca, New York, for a little bit. But I mean, the majority of my life I've spent here since I was about three or four. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you don't actually have any any stories of like Ontario. I I don't remember. A th- I mean, I love Ontario. I go my my mom's side of the family. They all still live there. Uh, cousins and aunts and uncles and all okay. that. So I most of my time there generally I like to spend it there in the summer. Like to go to the you know live the cottage life up in the Muskokas. That's mm. always good. That's that's my favorite okay, part of okay. what Ontario has. To <laughs> gotcha. So no, no, when no. it comes to handling Vancouver winter, like you can't really throw back to Ontario and be like, oh, Vancouver's nothing, because I, gotcha, gotcha. No, no, I was so, like, <laughs> I'm so wholly unprepared for it. I like, I like the cold. I mean, I shot a movie in Winnipeg a couple of years ago for, like, three months in the winter. That was, like, you know, hmm. negative 30 Celsius outside every day. My character's jacket was just a denim, it's just a denim jacket. That's all he had on. Was just that, sh- was that Denim jacket, negative thirty. <laughs> was that Woodland or it was another one? Else. No, that okay, was okay. Um, a movie called. It's now called "I Still See You," which I think is on Netflix now. Gotcha. I think they just put it on Netflix. Yeah, it was from uh, Lionsgate. We had a lot of fun. Doing it. It's like a thriller, nice. sort of like um, it's based off of a book called "Break uh, Break My Heart a Thousand Times." Um, and hmm. just some really great people worked on it. It was myself, Bella Thorne, Sarah Thompson, who did the hundred with us. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So many people. Yeah. You're a big. What about you? Horror what about buff. you? Where the hell have you been? <laughs> We're just gonna segue <laughs> real quick that way. All right. Fine. No. That's... <laughs> I want because I'm just for like friend to friend. I'm like I've been seeing you jump all over the place. I want to. I want to know what's going on with you. But yeah, I'll pin, um, I'll pin so, the horror buff stuff. All right, cool. Um, currently in California, um, 
during the pandemic when they when they shut down flights for a bit, I decided that I wanted to build a camper. And so I bought myself a moving truck and then I converted it into a tiny home. And yeah, I've been living in it for 168 days now. And because it's on wheels, I've been driving around with my partner. She decided to be crazy enough to say, you know what, I'm going to also go on this ride with you. And we went from Vancouver all the way to New Brunswick. Um, We wanted to get all the way to Nova Scotia, but we had some truck problems and it was in the shop for three weeks. And then within that time frame, it started to snow and our objective was to escape the snow. So we decided to say we we went east enough, went south to Florida and yeah. then went west all the way to Cali. And right now we're just hanging out in Cali and seeing what happens. And everybody's asking when I'm going to head back to Vancouver. And the answer is always when it warms up or they decide to offer me a job up there. <laughs> That's fair. That's a good man. So that's good. it's been, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Heck for of me. An adventure. Yeah, I don't yeah. doubt it. So, doubt one it. big thing, like I guess you'd empathize with, is one thing that I had to have in here was my espresso machine. So I have my espresso machine. <laughs> of course, you gotta have it. I got, I have got it. my back <laughs> right there. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Oh it's man! There, and I so, had coffee for the first part of the day, and that's you know I moved on into the into the cocktail for the for the end of the day. What's what's the alcohol? What's the beverage? It's not even a good one today. I I didn't want to use any of my nice stuff, so I just had a. Gotcha. Not that there's yeah. anything wrong with vodka. <laughs> just vodka is not my main thing. So I went into my freezer, got a vodka. I had a little can of ginger ale, so a little vodka ginger ale is what I'm having, and then also staying hydrated with water fair nice are you then like the person who likes the cocktail or are you just like for me i'm not a cocktail person if i have a long day or it's a celebration i like getting home and then a nice large ice cube and on the rocks or are you i gotta Fair. I'm more I'm yeah. more of a straight like you know I got all my scotches and my whiskeys back there. That's my main uh, move, no doubt, is a whiskey or a scotch yeah. or something along those lines, with maybe a rock or maybe neat, depending on how I'm feeling. Um, but yeah, sometimes I'll like a cocktail. I think it was you know it was like in fact, I got a ginger ale, I got some vodka. I'll just throw it together, and maybe maybe that'll be you know what this sugary, it's tasty. Why not? <laughs> when was the last time you fixed no, yourself a cocktail? Oh God! Like a proper cocktail, probably was on a proper oh, cocktail. Where I probably like made my mom and me. Oh yeah, like a like a Rob like a Rob like a Rob Roy probably was the last one I made. I think I made my mom and myself one of those on Christmas, which is like a Manhattan mm. but with uh, scotch. Nice. And then are you are you the one to like yeah. do the proper garnish, or are you just saying oh this twig looks nice and then just pop it on? <laughs> I mean, look, I try. I try to do it properly. I try to make it look nice. It's for my mom, after all, most of the time is when I'll actually actually make it. Um, but no, I'm not, I'm not a mixologist by by trade or by opinion. Fair. <laughs> Have you ever had the urge to explore that kind of world where it's like, I have time. I'll choose to explore becoming a sommelier or one of those. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Like, absolutely. I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like uh, COVID kind of gave us all a greater appreciation for our, for our like miniature hobbies. And now we're, we're moving. Mm -hmm. We like COVID made us want to be experts in them. It's like, Oh, you like cooking? Why don't you, I'm just going to be the, I'm just going to be like, I know what I'm talking about. I know where to get the best ham from like the best place. I know all this stuff. I think, I think COVID did that for all of us. It's like, if you like drinking wine over COVID, you probably became like an amateur sommelier over that time because why not do it? If you have the time, do it as well as you possibly can. 
no, that's fair. So then, other than yeah. exploring the alcoholic world, what other things did you pick up during COVID? Cooking, which I've always been, I think you, you know me, like I'm a big food guy. I love food. Uh, but I never really like, I was so, I just was felt lazy and felt like I wouldn't enjoy cooking for myself. And now that is all changed. Like I sold my old place, <laughs> bought a new place where the kitchen is amazing. Do the whole yeah. thing now. Like it's, it's like therapy for me when I'm not working, like the, nice. the cooking's like therapy. I love it. Nice. What's, what's the gourmet yeah. that you, you choose to dive into? I try to hit a little bit of everything, but I got to tell you, if like my stomach for the most part doesn't generally just be like, let's make a pasta, let's just make Italian all the time. So like, I think I've made pasta probably like three times, three different pastas this week. And like spend like, you know, like four yeah. hours making the pasta, like a, like a yeah. all day sort of thing, sort of an affair, which nice. is, you know, I think yeah. food, you can take it in food when, when there's been time and love put into it. Yeah. Are you all the way to the point where you make your own pasta then? Like you make your own pastas, whether it be spaghetti, Alfredo's? No. Oh, you gotta, you gotta no, do that. No, not yet. Not yet. I've like, I've, uh, I've looked at it. I've thought about it. I know it's not the hardest thing in the world. It just, it seems like it would be so tedious to me, even though I bet you I would enjoy it if I actually had like the cojones to do it. Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, I gotta, I gotta get you a pasta maker. I think that's the. <laughs> do you, Once do you, you make have your that own? In your I know kitchen, you. I know, I've seen you. You, you can cook. You, you bake. You cook. Yeah, yeah. The baking part was one of those things that I, I undertook over COVID. Was like, okay, I like putting stuff in the oven. How about bread? Let's try that. <laughs> I saw you do it. I saw you do it over the Instagram, and I was like, yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. Ask Louisa. I because like. There was a point where I was just bread crazy and I was making way too much. So then I give Hamza a loaf and then I give Louisa a loaf because she lived right across from me. So I was like, yeah, let's see. Let's see how this goes. And it, it made me feel like I was the local baker for a minute where I was like, oh, yeah, my sourdough is the best on the block. <laughs> Which is saying something during COVID oh. because, you know, your block had at least like 17 different sourdough starters all on that block if, if that might be a low no, number mine mine was mine was because like my friend who was Imagine. already baking had she and she graciously gave me some of her starter to get my own starter going and i kept it going for i'd say eight months until i decided to say you know what i'm going to move out into this truck and so i had to give up the starter unfortunately but i kept it alive and it was like a it was like a, a modern day Tamagotchi where you had to feed it. You had to mix it up. You had to, so I was like <laughs> keeping that maintained was, That's a, was a fun exercise and it helped keep me sane as well. Yeah. Cause it was like, Oh, what day is it today? It's baking day. It's Sunday. I got through a week. I deserve to make a whole bunch of bread. <laughs> Plus, I mean, your, pro your apartment probably smelled great with all the bacon, with all the bread being made in it. Like that's, that's one of the most comforting smells that I know. Yeah. Yeah. Baking was definitely something growing up where my mom would always, but she was more heavy in the desserts. So cookies, scones, muffins was always on the menu. And every night was like something else brewing. And then where I grew up, just down the street, there was a cookie factory. So two times a week, I had the pleasure of smelling freshly baked cookies at a industry um, size where it would take up the entire block. And you couldn't, I personally don't think there was anybody in that area that was like gluten free because the smell was just so overpowering where you hate yourself if you didn't enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. It would be, you'd have to move if you didn't like it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So what's going on with you? What's new in, in the world of Richard Harmon oh. coming into 2022? Let's see. So what's, what's yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, 
certain things, certain things are all the same as you can see, and and some things are new. Uh, I think work wise, uh, I've been really excited about this new show that I'm, I'm, I've been doing, and we just wrapped like right before the holiday break. So now I'm kind of in that, you know, you know it well, that's sort of like uh, that po just post getting done a project and you're just like, like I don't, I'm upset. I want to work. You know, like you haven't been, you know, you've been off work for two weeks and you're like, it's too long. So we're kind of doing that, but that, I'm really excited for that show. It's called the uh, fakes and it's, it's kind of like a nice foray into like, uh, like dark comedy for me, which was a really fun challenge. Hmm. Nice. Now, yeah. that's a great, like, what's the word? Um, th I think there's like two types of dark comedies where there's the one that it's heavy with the satire, where there's a lot of issues in people's lives that need attention, but people don't know how to bring it up. And then there's the dark comedy that I think where it's just like, it's gruesome, but at the same time, it's like it's you remember teletoon the network teletoon and then they had that adult swim oh yeah absolutely um, absolutely is is that so which which dark comedy are we in the, are we in, are we talking about uh, without because i know they don't want me to talk about it too much without me giving anything away it's more of like a gotcha <laughs> i think it like it's 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 easy to like laugh along to it's entertaining it's real it's like semi real life stuff that has happened okay but we're but we're taking it with what like so much like what really happened was kind of a little messed up but the way we portray it is like super hyperbolic and like over the top nice. kind of thing so it's like it's like a that, very man. exaggerated take on something that that may or may not have happened have you yeah. then had the opportunity to watch don't look up I was actually going to kind of say like it's it's somewhat I'm not going to say that it's don't look up but I mean that's like a similar ish dark dark comedy that that it is and I'm not going to say that because I don't okay. want people to be taken hand in hand <laughs> trying to like position these things but I think I think fair, what we've fair, accomplished fair. Is, is something pretty pretty special and I'm really excited for people to see it nice we got an exclusive <laughs> Oh yeah, the other, okay, other things that are new in my life. My new apartment, the balcony, I had a bunch of trees on my balcony that the I bought with the apartment from the last people that were here. Then I got this thing in under my door saying that the roofers are going to need to come in and take up all the tile on my balconies. So all those trees are going to have to come inside, which I didn't know about when I bought the place. So currently, I my living room, I'm living in a fucking like terrarium dude that's so it's just, fun. <laughs> i just have a palm <laughs> tree in my house so it's like and, and now i just realized today which is why i brought this up because an ant just crawled on my hand is that the ants were on the trees and when they got brought inside i have ants all over my apartment they're all over the floor. They're all oh, in my no. kitchen. They're on the television. I can't get a fucking break with this shit. <laughs> That's crazy though. So that's are, are they living? They're living in the tree then? I'm assuming that they must have been in like the, in the in the planters of the trees. Hmm. How how high above the ground yeah. are you? uh 10 stories oh wow you got some yeah. bougie ants ants that have never touched the ground <laughs> you you know you, you know me man like it's if i'm gonna have ants they're gonna be bougie ants <laughs> they're gonna be special ants <laughs> i'm gonna get oh, these man, i'm gonna get these fine. high quality ants oh, so goodness. that's what's new in my life i think is, you should is, some good, some bad, you know. Now, life. what's your position then in, in regards to to insects where for me, if I see like a bee 
that's that's just chilling and and struggling to fly i'll i'll give it some honey i'll take care of it for a bit and i'll feel special but i hate mosquitoes what's your position with ants i because my position with most insects is always what my dad kind of taught me which was like listen outside it's like really their domain that's your house <laughs> you protect your you, your you protect your house so i'm seeing these i'm seeing these ants i'm <laughs> flapping them all over the place i'm not I, I have no i have no uh hesitancy to kill these ants how explorative are you with your methods of termination because if i were you i would have probably bought a toad by now I don't know what that is. Oh, you mean like literally just like a, like a, like a, you mean like a toad, just a toad. Yeah, like like, like yeah, because toads eat ants. Okay, well that's weird. I guess that would have been one way. I I was putting up these ones because like this is my method. I literally I literally just I just finger press these things because they're the real they're the real tiny like tiny tiny ones. I didn't gotcha. even notice I had them until I saw one on the floor. And then, you know, when you kind of unblur your eyes, so you're not focusing on any one spot. And then it just looked mm. like my floor was moving. Damn. Well, go so to acid. That... <laughs> Wasn't there an, uh, an iPad app? Who knows? If I, did the, if I did the acid, the floor, the floor might start staying still if I did that. <laughs> Wasn't there like an iPhone app where like that was it, whereas you had to squish ants? I think I think that's it's time for a comeback for that just to kind of practice so you <laughs> you get better at this. <laughs> I need like a rocky training montage but on that for switching hands. <laughs> yeah, I, I, oh, I think man. that might work. So one thing that I was curious like to dig in your brain about was um so for me I'm a fan of Christmas movies, and I, I love my Christmas movie lead into, while you have your Halloween lead up into, which has made me kind of look at you as, as a, a horror buff in regards to that genre. So in a way. I'm curious to know what your opinion is, though, on the state of horror, modern day horror, where... I find it's not really horror anymore. And a lot of times they'll promote it as horror when in reality it's, it's a psychological thriller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I totally hear where you're coming from because I think you're correct in, in that what has happened is that the horror genre has become a lot broader than it used to be, which I think is a good thing. But I mean, it, it definitely means that you don't exactly know what you're getting into when you start a movie. If it's described as horror, it could, that could mean any number of things, which is one of the reasons why I love the horror genre though, is because it's so overarching and large and it's, and it's kind of, in it's, um, in it's geography of like what it kind of contains. Um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty happy with where modern horror is because I think it's like, you know, it's like, it's like music. Some you can say like, you know, is music today as good as it was back in the day? And you're like, well, of course it is. Music is music. You, you just have to go find what you like. And it's the same thing with horror. You just have to find what you like. Like I know for, for me, I'm going to plug another project now. Uh, in over the summer, I did a movie called Margo here. That's a horror movie coming up. I don't know exactly when it's going to come out, but I'm just did like ADR for it the other day so happy with how it looks because it's a really like fun kind of like old school throwback like 80s horror with a modern twist to it and that's all i'll say but it if so if we're looking for horror like a... and you want to have fun yeah go see that are we allowed to ask is it a slasher is it a paranormal it's kind of slasher but Okay, well, I mean, the, the, they did announce what the, the summary is, so I think I'm allowed to say what the summary is. They announced it online. It's about uh, some kids, you know, like young adults, these kind of people, who go to a, it's a typical, like, cabin in the woods type situation, you know, a classic. We've seen it, we've seen it a lot of times. But instead, the modern twist is that we go to a very modern Airbnb 
instead of like a cabin in the woods, we go to a modern Airbnb for spring break. And it's just six like college friends looking to, you know, drink, smoke weed, have a good time and, you know, party. And when we get there, it's a smart home. So it's run by an AI. I'll lead you to like, you know, where your imagination goes with that is that the AI caters everything to us, but also perhaps maybe does not have our best, uh, best interests in mind. Hmm. Gotcha. What's your opinion yes. on the evolution of AI and leading into things like the metaverse? Or have you even given that world any thought? I don't know much about metaverse. I mean, that's something that may, maybe I do know about it, but maybe I just don't know that that's what it's called. Uh, so you might need to explain that one to me. But my opinion on AI mm -hmm. and the transformation of that is like, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little, a little freaked out by it, but it's obviously very helpful. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't need that much help on things in a day to day life. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know too much about yeah. it. So I'm not. I'm not going to okay. sit here and cool. like damn it. But I'm also not going to yeah. sit here and praise fully. With your vast library of films that you've seen, do any of these topics jade you in a sense, like? I know there are people who are very swayed by the opinion of iRobot where robots mm. are going to go nuts. And then there's those others like Ex Machina who they, they look at these movies and they, they treat these movies as like as Bible where this is what's going to happen. Or are you just in movies and for sheer entertainment, it doesn't stick with you. Cause for me, that's what horror did to me is I'm, terrified of those slasher films and not so much the paranormal yeah. paranormal stuff um i i don't know why but like for some reason it's strange because i do believe in paranormal things but then these movies don't affect me as much as like let's say scream scream like messed me up as a kid and i'm still messed up i'm kind of oh, same here it messed me up <laughs> Scream what I love horror so, films, but it also was one that maybe like I was so terrified of that of that mask for so many years of my childhood, still to this day. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's like has movies has has there been any like AI movies that have kind of been like oh, that's uh that's a little too close to home. I mean you mentioned it. Ex Machina was probably the best I've ever seen at that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, what, a, what a terrific film that was. Do you foresee that happening anytime soon, do you think? Where's, where's your political radar in regards to the advancement of technology? I tend, sorry, I'm just killing an ant. Uh, I tend to stay out of that in my brain. It's something that I know that I'm not smart enough to kind of like know anything too much about. So I'm a, I'm a simple man. And I just like to have a, try to enjoy my life. <laughs> That's about it. I don't, I don't, I don't put too much thought into it, I suppose. Now you, you downplay it and you say that you're a simple man, but are you then the type to get fooled by these new age phishing schemes where it's like you'll get an email saying oh your bank account has been frozen click this link to unfreeze it okay i would be too i would be too here? lazy to unfreeze it i'd probably just go try to spend money on something and if it doesn't if it works then i'll be like well, that was a lie <laughs> oh man that's fair uh, mr Harmon. I'm curious yes. to know, in regards to the show The 100 and what a crazy success that show has been and what what's what did you expect of it when you first joined it and how were you in regards to the development of the ending? It, I mean, certainly when I joined it, I didn't think it was going to give me what it gave me over the next seven years. I certainly mm -hmm. didn't think that. I thought I, I'm always very excited to to get a job as we all are in this business. Like we don't, I don't think we take it for granted and, and know how many people want to do what we do for a living. So even if I, I thought it was a smaller role than it definitely was a smaller role than it turned into. So I was just excited to kind of 
be on another project and like that's good and we can still keep paying the bills by doing this which is like a dream come true and as it just kept going on and they kept extending it and it was really i owe so much of that to jason rothenberg who created it who i guess saw something in the character and, and, and myself and and kept us around for year after year after year and i i honest to god i wouldn't trade it for anything in this world like I, I love that show and the people involved with it and the people that are responsible for having me there for that long. I love it forever. Um, and then what was the second part of the question? And then in the culmination of the finale, how did that transpire in regards in your opinion on that? I, I was very stoked about how we did it, especially for my characters kind of ending before the final scene of the finale uh i kind of had myself and louise's characters had our own kind of like ending and a lot of that was like mm. partially my idea but jason made it so much better that i came up with at the beginning of the season that i was like i knew we had these mind drives in the back of our heads and i was like what if louise gets sick and then she dies but then i put her brain into my brain and Matt and Jason was like, slow down, slow, slow down. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's just absolutely insane. And then went away for a couple of months and he was like, remember that idea you had? Kind of that, but how about this? And I was like, oh my God, that's way better than my idea. But thank you for like, I guess I like, you know, helped kind of color that part of it, but he just used his brilliant writer brain and made it a lot better than I ever had the capabilities yeah. of making it. So I was stoked about how we ended it. Cause I kind of got to like, after seven years of playing that character, I kind of had my way on the way yeah. out. And that's, I can't even explain how cool that is as an actor. So Who having, having had a bad moment, director? did that ever, or has that sparked, or has it always been like, you've had that writer side of you that wants to break out and explore? Never. I couldn't even dream of being a writer. I wouldn't want to do it. I, I just love, I love what I do so much. Like acting to me is, it's something that makes, it stresses me out so much, but in like a great way that I don't want that yeah. stress of being a writer or a director. I think I have a writer's brain as far as like, when I'm attached to a character, I think any good actor probably does. It's like, you're so attached to that character. You kind of do have a couple of logical avenues for where that character could go because you've thought so much about that character. It's kind of hard not to play out scenarios of where he's headed in his life. Hmm. So I think that part of your brain, gotcha. you have a little bit of an actor brain in there for a uh, writer's brain in there for an actor, but never one that I would just come and like try to create from that. It's, I leave that to the professionals. That's fair. But then, not to say that you can't be both. I know so many people who are both, are like, and both actors and directors, or both actors and writers, or both directors right. and writers, and like all that stuff. I just have, I guess, at this moment in my life, I have a very one track brain, and I'm like, I'm cool with that. Even with all the books that you're reading, you haven't had that thought to be like, oh man, maybe this idea, nothing. Because you no. read a lot. So I'm I surprised don't read that, you that much. Yet. I just, I tried to, I got my book right here. I'm currently reading Cop on the Shore. I always keep nice. a Murakami you love, novel. You love him. I love Murakami and I keep his novel around whenever I'm doing interviews to always be like, oh, this old thing? Yeah, I just, <laughs> I've been on the page 97 for four months. That's so funny. Oh my goodness. I'm so a slow, I'm a very slow reader. I do love reading books. <laughs> Mm. One of the reasons why I wanted to dive into that exploration of the hundred is in regards to the talk of mental health, because the hundred like took off, um, and it being a Canadian production, I like, I didn't think it was gonna last as long as it did either, and I was happy that it did, and I was thrilled to finally get my part in it. But like, we were thrilled to have you. You've seen like you have had um, enough experience in the industry considering your whole family has been in it to kind of cope with, you know, the stardom type success that the show has garnered. But what was your, I guess, not solution, but what was your steps to making sure that that type of 
stardom didn't get away from you and, and burn out your batteries? Great question. Um, I think a big part of it is because I guess I never saw it as stardom. And I think a lot of people would probably say that. Um, but I mean, obviously, my life mm. did change as far as like, you know, people do recognize you on the street. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but it does happen from time to time. Um, and like, how does that affect the way that you are? And like, you know, people wanting to talk to you online and stuff. And I went through all of it and thought I had done such a good job of it. And I thought I did of staying the person I am. And I think I did, except the older I get, the more I look back at like when I thought I was really like killing it on being like, yeah, you're not even letting it change you. And I can see now as I'm older being like, no, you did a little bit. And you're like, you know that that's okay. How in the world were you, your life, your life changed. So how are you not going to change with it? And I think some mm -hmm. of that when I did change was for the good. And some of it was for, you know, a little bit of a, a little shit. So I needed to fix that as I got older. And I think as, as we all get older and like, you know, I'm 30 now, like, I think, I think I handle things a lot better now than I did as a 25 year old. And I, I would certainly hope that I do. So I think for the time I probably was doing pretty good for, for what the situation was and like keeping who I am humble. Um, but I wasn't mm -hmm. perfect by any means and I'm still not perfect, but I certainly think I'm better now than I was then. And I think the mm -hmm. getting older has made me realize that it's like, you're not, you're not yeah, yeah. done with like, you're not keeping just like, Oh man, so humble, so good. And like that you even think that is probably means you need to get something in the check. So I'm glad that I'm keeping yeah. tabs on it. Yeah. yeah. So what has helped you with keeping tabs on it? What's some advice that you can give to somebody who ends up being on a show and all of a sudden the show goes on for a hundred episodes? Yeah. Um, I mean, check in with yourself or God or the universe or whoever you answer to at the end of the day, I think it's important to check in, mm -hmm. check in with yourself at the end of the day. And, you know, we all answer to someone, whether it's ourselves or religious or the universe or karma or whatever you want to see it, we all answer to somebody. So check in mm -hmm. with that at the end of the night and see if like, would, would that person or that thing or that entity be happy with how I handled myself today? So I try to do that. I try to do that every night i do that through and then prayer. what got I, you i was raised catholic so like that's kind of part of it for me gotcha. so i do that through prayer but some people just do it in meditation some people yeah. do it in, there's a million ways to be a good person it doesn't require anything other than yourself to do so yeah yeah no that's fair that's true yeah deep thanks for that <laughs> now with your <laughs> with the your answer. background in <laughs> in this industry where it's all like it's a family affair for you um what was that like growing up and was there any pressures that you felt that you had to kind of live up to oh god i mean i certainly know that my my parents didn't want myself or my sister to ever get into acting which i totally get why they're like please don't do this but, you know, they raised us around film and, and they raised us around this business. And once you know film people, uh, they're just a bunch of weirdos. And it's hard to be anything else other than that. Like, I can't imagine myself working in any other field because I just love the weird types of people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they're the best. <laughs> they're, the, they're the best. There's yeah. no other way I can say it. I mean, they're the best for me. They fit for me. And that's because our parents yeah. raised us in that environment. So I think the only expectation was that it was not of us to succeed or for us to be actors or for us to even get into the film at all. I think the expectation was that like, if we ever hear that you're being a little shit on set, oh boy, that's going <laughs> to end up, that's going to end up bad. We were, we work in this, we work in this business. If you're getting too big for yourself, if you're getting, if you're becoming a little bit of a, you know, a rude actor or a rude, any type of person, we're going to hear about it. It's not going to be good. Mm. So I think there was mm. those expectations, which I, think, which I think were the best possible versions of expectations our parents could have put on us. Nice. You used a, a very specific yeah. word, um, success. What was the vision of success growing up and then has that changed for you? 
No, it's never changed. Um, the vision of success for me was that I never thought it would be possible, A, but I thought if hmm. in my wildest dreams, if I could have my job be an actor and I actually pay my, I want them to know, I want them to know what I do, uh, which is great. But at the same time, if I, even if they don't know my face or what I do, if I just play anything to just be working to the day I die as this, mm. as an actor, then things have gone so well. So, I mean, honestly, like, I feel like I've lapped my level of success like five times already. And I never adjust my scale of like, what, <laughs> what? It's like, okay, well, what's yeah. next? It's like, I don't care. I'm just going to keep running this, this lap until they kick me off the track. <laughs> That's it. That's success. You got an 800 meter nice. lap. Just keep running it until, until they literally just kick you out. And I plan on doing that until they kick me out. No, I like, I like that mindset. I, I like that. That's a, that's definitely tattoo worthy. If not like a, a winner's plaque of, of, you know how they have those live, live, laugh, love <laughs> posters that you buy for your, I would love it if they sell a me quote at home sense. They should sell, they should sell my <laughs> sayings at home sense. Of course, of course. Why not? I, I think that's uh, that's that should be the level of success that we're working for. Exactly. To get our quotes in home. Home <laughs> sense quotes is what I'm. Is what I... Oh man. Now, you said that you didn't think that it could happen. Nah. So, which is such an interesting phrase because. I was having this discussion the other day in regards to chasing this dream where it's like, what goes through your head as an artist or as a dreamer to say, yeah, no, it's never going to happen, but then you still pursue it. Where do you think, or what do you think is happening in our minds when, when we go under that adventure? Maybe it's because we know it was the only thing worth pursuing for ourselves, I think. Hmm. Like, I think there's just no plan B. It's smart to have a plan B. I, I just never had, you know, I mean, if like at the end of the day, if, if it ever, for some reason, completely falls off and it doesn't work out, then like, of course, I've, I have to live a life. Like, I'll find a plan B, but I currently don't have one. And it just feel like it was the only thing that got me up in the morning. You know, you wake up and I was so stressed about failing at this thing I never thought I'd succeed at that I kept trying, <laughs> which was some yeah. weird messed up mindset. But like, I, I hated the thought of failing so much at this, but I never thought I had the chance to succeed that I just kept, I just kept doing it <laughs> for the maybe just like one, one, one role and be gratified in that. Have two lines on something like that was enough. That was like, that's great. Yeah. That's fantastic if we can get that. Did you did you ever have that translate into another part of your life where it's like, let's say a video game. Oh, I can't lose this. This is my only. It's the only thing that's ever done it for me. Or like. It's, it's acting. Mm. It's the only thing that's ever done it for me in my life. In 30 years is the only time I've ever felt yeah. that. Ooh. Yeah. That's, heavy. that's it. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's all I, it's all I know, you know, like it's maybe it's part of like growing up around the business and seeing that so much and going, you know, visiting my dad on set back when I was a kid and seeing mm. actors like sitting at their cast chairs, just having a great time and being like, oh my God, what a dream that would be to just be around other actors yeah. and laugh and have a good time and be mm. taken, I don't know, seriously and have people pay you money to do this so cool can it's you so can you recall so cool. when the first time you had that thought of like i'm yeah this is what i want to do i started acting when i was 10 professionally uh and then i was gonna quit around 15 because it was like i'll never make an actual living off this but i had gotten like you know a couple very small roles here and there probably like four roles over five years kind of thing which is like is awesome that's great that i had even jobs was awesome um, but I never felt like I was really part of the onset atmosphere. Ha part of that probably was because I was a child and I wanted to be treated like an adult, but like, how are they going to treat you like an adult? Mm. They can't. Um, you're a kid. So then I was 15 and I was going to quit, but then I did a movie called trick or treat. Uh, and that movie just made me fall in love with acting and make me realize that like, it was the first time that a, 
I had been on set for longer than like two days, maybe. So it was like two months of shooting. I was there every, like, you know, once every couple of weeks, but it's like, it was, it was the longevity of working on the same project and getting to know these people around you. Uh, and it was after that, that I was like, there's no quitting. I can't quit this. I just need to, but what I need mm -hmm. to do is I need to take it more seriously. I need to work harder at it. If you really want to do this, then you, then you're going to need to put more work into it. And I remember that being the kind of the project that did it. What did that kind of work look like when you say you had to put more work? Oh, I mean, you had to put a lot more work into auditions for sure. A lot more into that, um, which because the more work I put into it myself, the more confidence I had. And I think you, you could probably also attest to this is that like one of the most important things an actor has is confidence. If you don't have, if you don't have it, it's very hard to put a, put a character together because what you, what you tr yeah. try to do with a character might not come through because your confidence isn't that, that you actually push hard enough to be able to portray it. Even if it's like the quietest, most subtle character in the world, you need to have the confidence to do, to do nothing then. And if you don't have that, then you might not be able to do it. So I think it was working on my confidence, which as you could tell from me saying, I never thought I'd have the, I'd never ever be successful. You could probably assume that I was a kid who was dealing with some confidence issues, which I, which I was. Uh, but it, this acting, you know, acting helped me be more confident in myself and become the person that I am today, which is through all of my oddities and quirks and much like yourself i'm sure we're both pretty happy with how we've turned out i could be better but i could also be a hell of a lot worse yeah no that's 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 a little toast to that one there's put that on yeah. a home sense plaque i'm just rocking <laughs> um, them up today this is good stuff <laughs> talk on that um this confidence that we need to have in this industry because it's such a, it's such a fickle thing because we need to have the confidence to say that we have something unique, but then at the same time, where does that confidence stop, which allots us that moment to say, I got to do more work. Oof. That's a great question. I don't know. Where mm. does it? Do you have an answer to this? Because now I'm curious. I I don't because like the thing that maybe really, that's work that we need to do. Yeah, where the thing is is like I just I wholeheartedly believe that we can always be getting better, and I think that's the that's the only answer to this riddle is as confident as we have to be, we also have to know that our confidence ain't shit we we need to always keep getting better but then it's it's just heartbreaking in my opinion when i'm talking to friends and they they just have this veil over their head where it's like they have what it takes to make that difference and it's like that's great but are you still going to class are you still reading are you still and then it's like they're just focusing on the fact that they have this confidence and i kind of think it lends its side to the toxic um quote where to to um what is it let oh wow i'm drawing a blank here and it's like one of those quotes that like really eats at me whenever i hear oh believe in the process yeah where it's like people just sit back and believe in the process when in reality the process is work the process doesn't just happen. The process needs to be worked on. So it's like, I'm, I want to try and crack this enigma for my friends or for people that I meet in the industry who I see that they're j just this ball of gift that they need to, that the world needs to see. But then it's like, there's, they just are too confident where they think that they they got it in the bag and it's like once you think that yeah, i think it's a downward spiral from there yeah i agree you need to be getting yeah. better i agree with you wholeheartedly and perhaps this is like this isn't a great this isn't a great quote don't put this on home sense but maybe it's never letting it's never letting confidence become cockiness as simply as that i mean it probably could be put a lot more beautifully than that but truly don't let your confidence yeah. become cockiness
Yeah. Hmm. Be confident in everything. Be confident in be confident in the fact that you need to be better. Yeah. But be confident in the fact that you are enough for some things, just not everything. Hmm. But then that's the thing where it's like when we start off in the industry, we're the ones that are constantly saying, oh, yeah, no, we could do that. Oh, can you hold your breath for six seconds? Like, yeah, of course I can. Tom Cruise <laughs> yeah. can, I can. We're, yeah. we're, we're kind of put into this world where we had to say that we can do it or else we're going to lose the part. And then we just find ourselves spiraling in, in this world of, oh, yeah, I said I could do that, didn't I? Oh. Yeah. Sometimes you sink and sometimes you float though. I mean, that's the thing. I think we've all been in both of those situations where sometimes you're like, I don't know, I've never done that before, but I'm going to give it a hell of a shot. And then sometimes you find out you're great at it. You're like, Oh my God, I can do it. I really can do this. Yeah. And other times you're like, Ooh, I needed more work. That really needed more work before I should have tried that. Do you have any, any nightmare stories or any miracle stories of that happening to you? No, not really. I mean, there's like minor ones. Like they're not ones that would be worthy of telling kind of thing. Hmm. Fair. Yeah. For me, I had a moment where they asked simply in the audition, do you smoke? And this was ages ago, back when I thought that smoking was the devil's stick. <laughs> it was like, for this part, I'll say, yes, I do. And so I get the part, we're on set, and then there's this really dramatic moment that I'm having where it's like you're really down on your luck and you you need to smoke the cigarette and you need to just inhale it, like drag the entire cigarette, inhale it, and hold. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do it, I can do it. Now, mind you, I've, I'd never smoke in a day in my life. Okay up to this point so you know that initial burn that that smoke will cause when it goes down it's unlike anything and else so, in the world oh my the first goodness. time now, you ever you have an inhale imagine. the word the first time and then it gets easier and then it gets the easier worst. and then it gets too easy <laughs> but then you can imagine me trying to pull myself together and hold that smoke in my lungs for this very tight close up. And I was just like, I don't know how I can lie about this. I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> and then it's like, so it took me like at least 10 tries to finally get my throat numb enough to the pain yeah. to hold it long enough. But yeah, I can tell you from this moment that wasn't, my oscar winning performance in that <laughs> that's tough so ever since that moment i was like yeah i think i'm going to be a little bit more honest about what i can and cannot do in <laughs> yeah, the last thing you want to do is show up uh, you know riding a horse and be like i can well, i can ride a horse and then you don't know how to ride a horse oh, man. it's not good for you it's not good for the oh horse. goodness it's, yeah and not only that it's it's definitely not good for for your career in that aspect where you hurting yourself is doing nobody any favors <laughs> uh, oh, no man. and it's like the truth the truth nine times out of ten is going to come out on that sort of a situation you know hmm. no that's fair um one more question before i i, I leave you but um this is in regards to the comic the comic-con realm the convention realm where it's like how has that opened your eyes in regards to that side of what fandom could look like oh my god i mean wildly you know it's it's i didn't know i did not know that kind of like it was never something that i would have known before like going or or being part of a show that that kind of occupied like an actual place in in a in a comic con society kind of thing, and mm-hmm. it's been like ninety nine percent great. Like it's beautiful what you see. It's beautiful the connections that you make um, with you know fans 
but it's just, it's just people. The connections you make with people yeah. that you had made a connection with on a television show that you did that you had no idea how much it meant to this one person. And you could sit at home hearing it over the internet and be like, oh yeah, well, like whatever, I'm sure they like me for whatever reason. But there's a difference when you look, look someone in the eye and they tell you why it mattered to them. Then it, mm. it all of a sudden makes you realize that maybe, you know, it mattered, <laughs> it mattered more than you realized that it did. And that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Like anyone who, who, I really hope that a lot of people that don't go to comic cons take that for granted. I really hope that they don't mm. because it's a pretty beautiful thing. No, that's beautiful. Yeah, no, it's because like I'm, I'm just amazed, and and I, I don't use that word lightly. Where I'm amazed at the cast of the hundred in regards to the high spirits that you guys kept on set as regularly as you guys would be at work, and then you'd head off to do conventions. Because I've I've heard the stories where it's like there's those other shows where they these new actors find themselves on something that's super successful but then it's like they don't get that time to rest and it's like fair you don't get that time to rest but at the end of the day look at you know the check that they're cutting you and realize yeah. that that's part of the job so it's like the fact yeah. that you guys were able to you guys did it well really well and Thank i just you. wanted to, to commend you. you on that and it's like thanks man in regards to mental health where it's like what was how did you guys you personally maybe you don't have to speak on everybody else but how did you personally sure. i guess manage that high energy because when you're at comic-con like you have to have a presence you have to have um yeah a type of yeah so it's like how did you where did you find that energy I don't know. For me, I suppose it came fairly, fairly easily. I mean, it's maybe it's just the type of person I am, but it's really nice being complimented all day long. <laughs> I, I had nothing <laughs> but time. Great. I had nothing but time for it. You know, we could have stayed there for hours longer. And I was like, oh my God, thank you. Yeah. This feels good. <laughs> um, but I get like, you know, not everyone gets the same thing out of that that I do. So again, like, thank you for not having me speak for everyone because I think everyone dealt with it differently. Uh, I know that what I can speak to one thing that happened to me one time where I did like a lot of them in like a four month period of time where I was like not home for four months. Hmm. And I remember coming back to Vancouver after all of it and i was just depressed and i'm i'm a very lucky person that i don't deal with like my bag of mental mental problems uh i'm very fortunate like i'm very fortunate to have the, the chemicals in my head work fairly fairly well on a day-to-day -day basis in this one situation i was like not doing well when i got back because i was moving so much and like having a great time at all these conventions but like I, I didn't feel like i belonged anywhere i didn't see all my i saw some friends every week but no one on a consistent basis so i felt like i didn't belong in anyone's lives anymore and i came back and you know boo-hoo <laughs> you're just in paris and all these beautiful places but you know, it, it weirdly does affect you. So I, you know, I just had to, for a second there, just sit down and be like, okay, that's it. I just mm -hmm. need to sit and, and reconnect myself to my life and the life of those around me whom I love. You need to take time to do that. And mm -hmm. I hope other people do as well when they're doing that many conventions. There, dope, awesome. Yeah. Well, Mr. Richard Harmon. Thank you so much for joining Thank us you, sir. and for sharing and giving us all your insight and amazing quotes that I do hope one day make it onto somebody's mantelpiece. <laughs> but you know everybody, <laughs> thank you all for tuning in. Two Degrees Podcast brought to you by the Play On Foundation. Check out Richard Harmon and everything that he's doing and make sure to check out because hopefully right now we can get this episode out soon enough. Woodlands on Amazon. Buy that, rent that, tell a friend about it. Good time. <laughs> Thank you for doing the pitch for me. Thank you for remembering. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming out, man.